Beneficial bacteria colonies play a crucial role in aquariums, but there are several key types that function in different ways. For this video, I want to highlight some of the most important types of bacteria commonly found in aquariums, as understanding them can help aquarists make small adjustments to their setups and significantly enhance the benefits they provide. For those who prefer reading, I've linked my fully sourced blog post in the description. First, let's talk about ammonia oxidizing bacteria. These bacteria generate energy by converting toxic ammonia into nitrite in the presence of oxygen using CO2 as their carbon source. They are among the most common types of bacteria in aquariums and are typically found on surfaces with access to dissolved oxygen, such as filter media, hardscape, plants, and the top layers of substrate. Ammonia oxidizing bacteria play a crucial role in aquariums and are often the first step in the nitrogen cycle, helping to convert toxic nitrogen compounds into safer forms. Each genus of these bacteria contains multiple species with varying efficiency depending on factors such as ammonia concentration, water temperature, pH, and KH levels in the aquarium. Under optimal conditions, these bacteria can double their population in 7 to 24 hours, but in poor conditions, this process can take up to 70 hours, significantly prolonging the tank cycle in process. These bacteria are naturally present in drinking water and typically enter aquariums when tanks are initially filled. Many bacteria in a bottle products contain ammonia oxidizing bacteria to help speed up the cycling process. However, these products are often formulated for the expected water parameters of their target market. For example, Fritzzyme 7 made in the USA is designed for aquarists with hard tap water, which applies to over 85% of US households. In contrast, its performance may be less effective in Europe, where 50 to 60% of households have hard tap water, depending on the country. When using a dirted tank method, such as the Wallstad method, these products are often unnecessary. Soil naturally contains thousands of microorganisms, including ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Additionally, soil also hosts ammonia oxidizing archaea, which research suggests can outperform bacteria in many setups, making them a primary contributor to converting toxic ammonia into nitrite. Next, we have nitrite oxidizing bacteria which produce energy by converting toxic nitrite into nitrate in the presence of oxygen using CO2 as their carbon source. I know they sound similar, but if you are new to the hobby, nitrite with an I and nitrate with an A are different nitrogen compounds in our tanks. This process is often the next step in the nitrogen cycle, helping to protect fish from harm. Remember, these requires nitrite for energy production, so their colony usually starts to develop a little later in the cycle once ammonia is converted to nitrite. While nitrate is technically a toxic compound, it is harmless in the levels typically found in most aquariums, especially if you keep fast-growing live plants or perform regular partial water changes. Nitrite oxidizing bacteria generally require less oxygen than ammonia oxidizing bacteria, but still thrive on surfaces where dissolved oxygen oxygen is present. As a result, both types of bacteria are often found together in aquariums. Unlike ammonia oxidizing bacteria that require a small amount of KH, nitrite oxidizing bacteria require a small amount of phosphorus, which is usually provided in your tap water. Like their ammonia oxidizing counterparts, nitrite oxidizing bacteria are naturally found in drinking water and can enter your aquarium in small amounts during the initial setup. They are also included in most bacteria bacteria in a bottle products, but again the specific species used are typically chosen to match the target market tap water. Next we have complete ammonia oxidizing bacteria or Comamox bacteria. In 2015, researchers discovered two nitrospira species capable of fully oxidizing ammonia to nitrite and then to nitrate. These bacteria produce specific enzymes that enable them to perform both phases of the nitrogen cycle within a single microorganism. Since their discovery is relatively recent, much remains unknown about their specific requirements. Unlike other nitrospira species, Comamox bacteria appear to thrive in low levels of dissolved oxygen. Research indicates that their largest colony 
bodies form in water with dissolved oxygen levels of 0.24 to 0.27 milligrams per litre. While they are still aerobic, these bacteria seem to prefer conditions that are close to anoxic. Although nitrospira species are commonly found in drinking water, it's challenging to confirm whether these specific comamox species are present. However, they have been identified in a wide variety of rivers and lakes worldwide, suggesting they are adaptable and relatively easy to maintain if you can get them in your aquarium. Next, we have denitrifying bacteria, and this is easily the most controversial type in the aquarium hobby. If you're new to the hobby or not as fascinated by microorganisms as I am, you might want to use the timestamps to skip ahead, as this one can get a bit confusing. Denitrifying bacteria are the bacteria that products like Zika, Matrix, and BioHome claim can grow in them when used as filter media to passively convert nitrate into nitrogen gas. This idea has sparked a lot of debate with strong opinions on both sides. While the existence of denitrifying bacteria is unquestionable, supported by countless research papers, most of this research is on professional wastewater treatment facilities with specialised equipment that carefully controls dissolved oxygen levels for optimal bacterial activity. The primary argument against these bacteria thriving in aquarium filters is that filters typically have high dissolved oxygen levels which are thought to prevent the formation of the low oxygen environments these bacteria require. However, one study found that denitrifying bacteria could be successfully cultivated in an aquarium in a 5 cm deep pumice substrate, removing 85.17% of the nitrate in the tank. I'm currently cycling this aquarium with a large amount of lava rock and I noticed nitrate levels dropped from 40 parts per million to 20 parts per million without live plants or water changes. While I'm not definitively claiming denitrifying Refining bacteria were responsible. This occurred in a tank where I have complete control over the conditions. Next up, we have anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria or anamox bacteria, which are also a bit controversial in the hobby. These bacteria were discovered in the early 1990s, but unfortunately, most of the research available focuses on commercial wastewater treatment facilities where specialized equipment is used to control oxygen levels. What we do know is that anamox bacteria bacteria require anaerobic conditions with a complete absence of oxygen to function. In theory, a deep substrate setup such as one with fine sand similar to a father fish style aquarium could limit water penetration with dissolved oxygen, creating conditions that allow these bacteria to develop. However, the grain size of the substrate is critical for this process as larger grains allow more oxygenated water to flow through. Similarly, aqua soil is generally unsuitable for anamox bacteria because its small round particles also let too much oxygenated water to pass through. Anamox bacteria require both ammonium and nitrite as energy sources, meaning they would typically develop later in the nitrogen cycle when nitrite becomes present. Additionally, because they use ammonium rather than ammonia, they are more likely to thrive in lower pH environments where the ammonium to ammonia ratio is in their favour. I recently started two deep substrate Wallstad method tanks and while I'm not particularly experienced with deep substrate setups, both tanks cycled far quicker than my regular substrate Wallstad tank that I set up around the same time. Next we have heterotrophic waste eating bacteria which function a bit differently from the other bacteria we've discussed and, in my opinion, are one of the most underrated bacteria types in the hobby. These bacteria create energy by consuming organic material in the tank that would otherwise decompose into ammonia. As these bacteria break down organic debris in the soil and leftover matter in the tank, they provide a steady supply of CO2 to support a thriving ecosystem. While the CO2 levels they produce aren't as high as those from an injected CO2 system, they still enhance plant growth, which in turn helps absorb more toxic nitrogen compounds, keeping your fish safe. Additionally, both ammonia oxidizing and nitrite oxidizing bacteria require CO2 as a carbon source to function function, so the activity of waste-eating bacteria indirectly improves their efficiency as well. One of the most common genera of waste-eating bacteria is Bacillus, but this genus has been surrounded by a persistent myth in the hobby. Many still believe Bacillus causes columnaris disease, however, this misconception originates from a well-documented misidentification in 1922. The real culprit was later reclassified as a species of Flavobacterium unrelated to the Bacillus. G 
genus. Today, there are 266 recognised species of bacillus waste-eating bacteria and only a handful have been linked to any issues with fish. Another popular genus is Pseudomonas, which includes over 200 species, six of which are documented to cause problems for fish. Among these, Pseudomonas fluorescens is the most well-known, with a doubling time of 60 minutes in optimal conditions. However, Bacillus subtilis, a non-pathogenic species, doubles even faster every 20 minutes, allowing it to outcompete Pseudomonas for resources. This lets you take advantage of the competitive exclusion principle, where beneficial bacteria like Bacillus subtilis suppress the growth of potentially harmful strains, helping to keep fish safe. While it's unlikely you'll completely eliminate harmful waste-eating bacteria from your tank, maintaining a strong colony of non-pathogenic bacteria keeps harmful populations small enough for healthy fish to fend off any issues naturally. Additionally, other harmful bacteria that rely on organic matter to survive can also be suppressed by non-pathogenic species. If you're using a dirted tank, it's highly likely you already have Bacillus subtilis and other non-pathogenic species present in your soil. For tanks with inert substrates or baked aqua soil, which lack significant bacterial populations, products like Fritz Zyme 360, which contains various Bacillus species, can be used to establish these colonies in your tank. Finally, we come to purple non-sulfur bacteria. While these bacteria have been studied since the 1950s in the wastewater treatment industry, they've only recently gained attention in the aquarium hobby. At first glance, they might seem like miracle bacteria because of their remarkable adaptability. Unlike most bacteria, PNSB can switch between all four metabolic states depending on their environment, where other bacteria would typically fail to survive. Research highlights their exceptional role in bioremediation as they can break down both organic and inorganic waste in aquariums. Studies have also shown that PNSB can manage levels of certain heavy metals and help reduce phosphate and nitrate concentrations. At least one species of PNSB is naturally found in soil, meaning they may already be present in dirted tanks. For aquarists looking to introduce these bacteria, products like the PNS Pro Bio range by Hydrospace are commonly used, especially in the saltwater side of the hobby. While some species of PNSB can survive in freshwater aquariums, they typically prefer anaerobic environments with adequate light. Conditions more commonly found in setups like saltwater live rock tanks rather than standard freshwater setups. Fortunately, most of the benefits provided by PNSB can be easily replicated by other types of bacteria and freshwater plants, meaning the freshwater side of the hobby isn't missing out. I just want to quickly remind people of my fully sourced blog post linked in the description as there's a lot to take in, especially if you are a beginner. Anyway guys, that brings the video to an end. Thanks for watching and have a good day.